Coley, so I'll talk to you more about that later. Welcome, everybody, to MSP Tutor. Uh, this is not the show where we ask the tough questions. This is the show where we teach you something useful. Uh, so today I'm joined by Tim Fitzpatrick, B2B Revenue Accelerator. Uh, Tim, welcome. Thanks for joining Steve, me. Steve, thanks for having me, man. I'm excited to be here and uh, do my best to add value to the audience. I'm sure you'll do just fine. Yes. So uh, this, for, for those of you watching, uh, this is the third episode ever of MSP Tutor. It's a, it's a new show. It's, it's not, I, I'm not new at doing this though. You know, I've been doing this since 2017. So uh, we're, we're just doing things in a, in a more structured format and, and splitting things up into different shows, different days. So um, the, the first show we had Matt Lee from PAX 8 come on and he talked to us about uh, running a tabletop exercise for incident response, cybersecurity, you know. Um, last week, we had Nate Friedman come on from uh, Tech Pro Marketing, and he taught MSPs how to set up their web page correctly. And today, Tim is going to talk to us about strategic lead generation. Uh, so, Tim, why don't, why don't you kind of give us a little bit of background, yeah. like why should we trust you as the, the quote, expert on lead generation? Sure. So I, uh, Steve, I've been in marketing for, for a little over 10 years. Um, I, my company, Rialto Marketing, I, I started it late 2012. Um, and I'm not going to tell you that my path in marketing has been straight, right? Marketing is so broad at this point. You know, a lot of us are just battling information overload when it comes to marketing. And um, I was too. And so, you know, it took me a while to really find what what I enjoy about marketing and what I'm great at. And what I enjoy and what I'm great at is marketing strategy, planning, and then and leadership. You know, and so when I think of those three things with marketing, you've got to have those three things in alignment if your marketing is going to work consistently and it's going to be repeatable. And so when I think of strategy, I think of it like fuel and I think of planning where as your vehicles and leadership is the driver, right? So you have to have all of those things. And so that's where I focus and specialize in the marketing realm. Um, so I stay in the lane that I'm good at. And that's what we're going to talk about today is lead gen, but more from a strategic standpoint. A lot of, a lot of MSPs jump right into the marketing tactics. You know, I've got to have a website. I've got to have a YouTube channel. I need a podcast. I need to create content without really having a strategy and a plan behind it. And then, you know, they wonder why it doesn't work. It, and it doesn't work because the sequencing is, is out of whack. We've got to get that strategy in place first. Then we can start to jump into the vehicles because any of the marketing vehicles that are out there can work, but okay. they got to have the fuel behind it. So um, that's why I think people should, uh, should listen to what I have to say today. Cause it's taken me, it's taken me 10 years to really get good at strategy and understanding the fundamentals and the principles of marketing that most people skip. Gotcha. All right. Well, um, I guess let's, let's dive in. Where, where do you want to take us first, sir? Yeah, sure. I appreciate it. Uh, so here's the first thing I'll say, why is what we're going to talk about today important? It's important because without strategy behind what you do with your marketing, you are going to waste time and money on ineffective marketing, right? The second thing is when you have strategy, it helps you focus on the things that you should be doing, but equally as important, not what you should not be doing, right? And it goes back to what I said before, there's information overload with marketing and we really have to know what our priorities are and what our priorities aren't. Um, and so that's why what we're going to talk about today is super, super important. What I'm going to run people through today, and I'm going to try and make this as simple and as actionable as possible, um, because strategy can get somewhat theoretical at times, but we're going to keep this simple. Okay. And the easiest way to remember what we're going to talk about today is an acronym, HIM, right? H-I-M. Okay. We're going to talk about 
honing in on your target market. I'm going to talk about creating an ideal client GPS, which is that list of how do I get in front of the people that I want to work with? And then I'm going to dig into crafting your marketing message, right? To help differentiate your MSP, which is which a lot of MSPs struggle with. So that's what we're going to run through today. Him, H-I-M, okay? So first thing is honing in on your target market. How do we actually do that? And the reality for most MSPs, you know, if you're if you're starting out from scratch, this is going to be a little bit different. But I'm gonna I'm gonna approach this assuming that you've been in business for a while. You've got current class clients, you've got past clients. You don't need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to honing in on your target market. The easiest place to start is by looking at your existing and your past client base. And the the place to start is by asking yourself the three power questions. That's what I call them, three power questions. Who do I love working with? And by the way, if you love working with them, typically they love working with you. Who are your most profitable clients? And when I say that, I don't mean your top line revenue, your highest top line revenue clients. Oftentimes the highest top line revenue are not necessarily the most profitable. I want to know your highest gross profit clients. And then I, oh, then you also want to ask yourself, who are we getting great results for, great outcomes? When you ask yourself those three questions, you end up with a group of clients that check all three of those boxes. My first, the, my first hypothetical question to the MSPs that are watching, listening to this is, like how, how much better would your business be if you worked with people every day that checked all three of those boxes? Oh, that's, I mean, that's right. Simple. Yeah. It's significantly better, right? Your clients are happy. You're going to be happy. Your team's going to be happy. You're going to be making money, which there's nothing wrong with that. In order to stay in business and serve people at the highest level, you have to make money. Mm -hmm. um, and your clients are going to be super happy because you're getting great results, which means you're going to get more referrals and they're going to want to stay with you. So you've asked yourself those questions. You've got this group of clients that check all three of those boxes. Now what we can do is dig a little bit deeper in to, into the, those clients. And by digging deeper, what we're going to do is we're going to look at like, who are these people? What do they look like? From a demographic standpoint, right? Demographics are the numbers. Really, like, but who are they? You know, are they in specific types of industries, right? Are our main contacts certain types of people, right? Are you dealing with the the CEO, the CFO, the CTO? Who is it? Um, you know, what are their? We're going to look at their psychographics. The psychographics help us really understand what's going on in their head. What are they thinking? Right? What are the common problems that they have? What are their goals, their aspirations? Right? What are the pain points, the roadblocks that they're experiencing as it relates to what you do? We want to start to paint that picture of what these people look like. And when we dig in and start to do that, oftentimes commonalities start to float to the surface. And it's those groups that share those, have those commonalities where you start to look for your ideal clients. And it's, I'm going to tell you, Steve, if, if you take the time to go through this exercise, which most don't, it, it, it will really open your eyes because a lot of people don't realize like, oh my gosh, you know, half of our clients are in one specific industry, right? Or two specific industries. Um, maybe we need to start focusing in and honing our marketing efforts on those types of people. Hmm. Okay. Because we can't, if we try to target broadly with our marketing, it falls flat, right? You're the message is too broad, right? One of my mentors always said like specificity sells, the more specific we can get, the more our message is going to resonate with those people and engage with those specific types of people. And so we really do need to, to hone in on who are the ideal clients. It's not, when I ask most MSPs who their ideal clients are, typically it's a small business that that's in, in this area, 
and it's whatever, 20 to 50 seats or 50 to 100 seats. That's too broad. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, when, when I was running my MSP, I, I quickly learned that um, for, for some reason, I did really well with funeral homes. I had quite a few funeral home clients and it, it just kind of like, you know, I started working with one and then I started working with another and then word started to spread. Right. So, so then, you know, I'm in, I'm in BNI and that's a, for those of you that don't know, that's a networking group where you get referrals and pass referrals between each other to, to help each other grow your business. And, um, Every week you you stand up for 60 seconds and, and talk about like, who are you looking for? And so many times people would fall into that trap of saying, I'm looking for anyone with a computer. Yeah. And, and like, no, you're not because you're going to get grandma, you know, some 83 year old woman with a computer who doesn't know what she's doing. And she's going to call you all the time and you're not going to be able to charge her what you deserve to be paid because she's a consumer and not a business. And so, and you're going to feel bad because she's 83. So now, now you're doing all this extra handholding for somebody who's sucking up all of your time and energy that you should be putting into uh, supporting a business yeah. that is, is generating great profits for you. Yeah. So, so we're going to, we'll we, use, let's let, yeah. thank you for bringing that up, Steve, because I'll use that example of funeral homes, right? Because it's the other benefit too, right? And tell me if I'm wrong here, but once you knew that you were working with a lot of funeral homes, not only does that, if you choose to focus on that, not only does it help your marketing efforts, it helps everything else that comes after that, right? Your, your tech stack can become much narrow, right? You know exactly how to help that particular type of client. You know the specific problems they have. You know what they're going to need. And then on the fulfillment side of it, right, as you onboard those clients and service those clients, your operation becomes much more efficient as well because you're not reinventing the wheel each and every time. So mm -hmm. it helps your marketing. It helps your sales. It helps your operations. And it you're going to be more profitable for it. So there's a ton of benefits in doing it. Um, so once let's, let's go back to, Hey, you know, you mentioned, Hey, I started looking at it and realized I was working with a lot of funeral homes, right? Whatever comes to the surface comes to the surface. And then you have a choice to make, you know, are we going to hone in and narrow our marketing efforts? Right. I, that doesn't, a lot of MSPs get, you know, a little nervous saying, well, am I just going to direct all of my messaging to funeral homes? Well, I mean, you could, and I think that's, that's very effective, but if you're a little nervous about that, you, you can focus your marketing efforts on funeral homes without shifting your entire message right off the bat. Right. So there are ways that you can jump in without just going all in. Um, but the other thing that I think is important, once you, if you decide on some specific vertical markets that you're going to focus on, I think the other thing that's important to ask yourself is, is this a strong market? And there are five things that I look at with the market. One is quantity, right? Are there enough of these types of people for us to focus our marketing efforts there? And Honestly, one of the one of the simplest things to ask is just like, it, look, it, are there associations or groups for these people? You know, are there shows? If there are, odds are it's big enough, right? Because the reality is most MSPs are not looking for hundreds of new clients. Mm -hmm. You know, they're looking for five to 10 a year, right? So most markets are going to be large enough, but that's a good threshold to look at. Second is, are they in pain, right? Do they have a significant pain that you as an MSP can help them solve, right? If the pain's not great, they're not gonna, they're not gonna wanna move forward, right? They're not gonna take action. Third is, do they have buying power? Do they have purchasing power, right? If there's enough of them and they're in pain, but they don't have money to pay you, then that's, 
that ain't going to be good, right? So, so they've got to have the money to pay. The fourth thing is, is the market easy to target? No, right? Are they easy to get in front of? Because from a marketing and a sales standpoint, if they are not easy to get in front of, you are going to be banging your head against the wall because you're just going to struggle. It's like, I can't get in front of these people, right? That makes it really difficult to get in front of them from a marketing and sales standpoint. So they need to be easy to get in front of. And then the fifth thing is, is that market growing? Or at the very least, if it's not you know, growing significantly, is it growing at a rate equal to the rest of the economy, right? What you don't want is to hit your wagons to a market that's that's declining or decreasing. So once you've kind of honed in on, hey, these are the types of clients we're typically serving. And I think there's some groups that we can focus our marketing efforts on. Let's just double check and make sure it's a strong market to hitch our wagons to. Once we've done that, the next thing that we can do with honing in on our target market is interviewing those clients. Interview those clients that you've now chosen that you're going to focus on. And Steve, most people never do this. But it is amazing. Frankly, if this is the one thing people do from this episode, like it, it's worth the time. Because as business owners, it's really hard for us to think objectively about what we do, right? We're, we're too close to the fire. We're in our business every day. But when we talk to our clients, they can articulate our value and, and what we do uh, for them in a way that we've never thought about. And it's in their words, which is what we want our message to be. We want our message to be in their words, not our own. And so y- there will be stuff that clients will tell you that you'll just be like, oh my God, I, I, how could I not see that? Right. It's right in front of me now that they brought it up. So I want you to interview those ideal clients. Uh, the more you can talk to, the better, I think. But, you know, I would shoot for a minimum of five if you can. But if you can only get two or three, then it's better than where you were before. But what we want to do in these calls, and these are 25, 30 minute calls. It can be a phone call. It can be Zoom. It could be face to face, whatever's whatever's most comfortable. But what we really want to do is understand what, you know, why they worked with us, what they love about working with us, why they continue to stay with us. You know, if they had to tell somebody what we do and why they should work with us, what would they say? We want to understand what the journey was like, you know, when mm-hmm. they realized, oh my gosh, like I need a new MSP. Or I need somebody to help me with my IT. Whatever that potential trigger is, we want to understand what that trigger is. And then we want to understand, well, what, what, did, what process did they go through? Like, how did they get information? How did they research the market? How did they find you as an MSP? How did they find other competitors to talk to? We want to understand that process in as much detail as possible. So one of the things, and honestly, if I, I could talk about this for the next hour. So, um, but I want to make sure we get through the entire acronym. What I will do, um, for, for your audience, just all they need to do is email us at info at rialtomarketing.com. So it's info at R I A L T O marketing.com. Just say, Hey, watch the MSP tutor episode and we'll send them the ideal client profiler document that we use when we interview clients for for people that we work with. Okay. There's a whole list of questions. It walks you through just all the various questions that you can ask. And then you can kind of tweak those to your needs, but I'll just give that to people. All the details are right there. Okay. But I'll give you an example of this. Okay. Um, And actually, before I do that, one of the other things I will say too is the other thing you can do in addition to ideal client interviews is you can look at reviews. Your reviews, what are people saying about your competitors? You can also look at what people are saying in in groups. Are there social media groups, online forums, 
or the market you're serving, what types of things are they saying related to IT? That's where you can start to gather some really good information. So here's a perfect example of this. Um, we went through this process with a client. This was probably five, six years ago. Um, and it was, it was actually, a, a, it was not an MSP. It was a, a residential siding contractor, which contractors are notorious for, you know, you go to their website and, you know, we're the number one contractor in Denver or, you know, high quality, highest quality roofer in Denver. Like that doesn't mean anything. We looked at their online reviews and there was a woman that said, the thing I loved about these guys is they treated my house like it was their own. That like is that. an immediate differentiator right there. You know, so think about, I need new siding or I need a new roof. And instead of going to their five competitor sites and seeing the same flavor of message, you go to their site and it's, Hey, we'll treat your house like it's our own. They expect high quality service. They expect high quality products. That's not a differentiator. What is a differentiator is, are you going to come to my house, put on a new roof, and I'm going to find roofing nails in my yard for the next year? Like nobody wants that. But if you're treating their house like it's the, your own, you're going to take that time to do the job right to make sure that everything's cleaned up, right? There's all kinds of things that start coming to the surface when people see that message. These are the kinds of things that come to the surface when you talk to your ideal clients and you really hear your value. Like a lot of MSPs think that they're solving IT problems. You're really not. You're solving larger business problems and, and you want to understand the larger business problems that you're solving because it's those problems that are going to get people to buy in most cases. So that's H, right? Honing in on your target market. Mm -hmm. Now I want to shift gears and talk about, I know who my ideal clients are. I've gathered information. I've heard in their own words why they're working with us, right? I know that it's a strong market to go after. Now, how do I get in front of those people? What we want to do here is we want to make sure that you're fishing where the fish are, right? You're casting a lot. You know that you want to catch trout. You go to the local trout pond. You put a line in the water with some bait. You know you're going to catch trout. As opposed to what most people do, which is throw a net out into the middle of the ocean and hope that they're going to catch a fish. In your earlier analogy, Steve, like, you know, you work with grandma, but you really don't want to work with grandma, right? No, like. No. We, we need to hone in and be very targeted, fish where the fish are. Our marketing is going to be more effective. We're going to convert better, and we're going to be working with better fit clients, which is what we want. So what we need to do in this I step is create, you, I call it an ideal client GPS. It is a list of where you can go to get in front of the ideal clients that you want to work with. So back to your, your example of funeral homes, Steve, mm -hmm. where do they congregate? Like, where are they online and offline? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. And frankly, this is, this is easier now than it was before. I wouldn't say it was difficult before, but with the, with the internet and now with tools like ChatGPT, you can start to go through this process very quickly, gather a lot of information and then refine it. So what I would recommend most MSPs do is jump on ChatGPT and ask these types of questions, okay? You wanna understand where they are. So this could be, you could go into ChatGPT and go, are there websites that, and uh, tell me, Steve, were most of the time, were you talking to the funeral home directors? Yeah, so so the the directors are I wouldn't say they're the bosses okay. because some funeral homes have multiple directors, right? Mm -hmm. But typically the president, CEO, what whatever okay. you want to call 
the the person mm -hmm. in charge typically they are a director okay. um which which means they're they're the ones that are you know doing the embalming and and doing okay. all the work with the the i don't know if the patient is the right word but um <laughs> But they're 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 the ones doing the work with the the recently departed, yeah. And they're also the ones that are kind of like, you know, how there's like a wedding planner, and and they're they're the ones that kind of help manage the wedding and make sure yeah. the event goes smoothly. They're there to make sure that the event goes smoothly on the day of as well. Got it. So this could be, you know, you could go into ChatGPT and say. Um, are there websites that funeral home, you know, CEOs, presidents, directors, owners uh, typically frequent to gather information, right? Something like that. And you can, you, sometimes you'll have to tweak these questions a little bit depending on what you get, but it'll spit out a list, right? And you can take that information, put that on your ideal client GPS. This is not need to be difficult. A Word doc, a Google doc. I just want you to take those and, and list those initially. Mm -hmm. Then we're, we're going to want to look at, you know, are there forums or communities that they belong to, right? So again, are there forums that funeral home directors, presidents, owners frequent for information, right? Are there social media groups they belong to? Are there, I mean, you know, again, this is kind of, because of the topic, this may sound kind of weird, but like, are there influencers in the space, you know, um, that they follow? Are there um, podcasts that they listen to? Are there email lists that they subscribe to? Are there blogs that they read? YouTube channels that they follow? Uh, associations or organizations that they belong to? Uh, who are the vendors? Who are the major vendors and suppliers in the space? Are there magazines that they read? Are there trade shows or conferences that they go to? Uh, do they have specific professional certifications? Right. You this can ask a very all extensive list. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's we want to make sure that you've got as detailed of a list as possible, because what happens, right? I've now asked all these questions in chat GPT. It's given me a bunch of details. I put that in my ideal client GPS doc. Now what we need to do is confirm. Like, And to me, that's where you then go to Google and you start, one, looking at the sources that ChatGPT has given you. But then you can also ask the exact same questions in Google search or Bing or whatever and see what comes up because you're also going to have some other things that pop up that, you know, chat GPT or whatever AI tool you're using didn't, didn't find. Right. And, and Tim, I, I want to cut in real quick. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to teach you something, sir. Yeah. There is a search engine that uses AI. It's called perplexity. Yeah. And I know yeah. Google is probably launching some AI stuff soon. Right. Yeah. But um, perplexity, I love because it has the power of a search engine. It's It's got the spiders. It, it finds the most recent and most relevant results. But then it's also got that uh, LLM and that generative AI to yeah. where I can ask perplexity questions like, hey, what are the top funeral director events? And it's going to tell me what the events are, what what dates the next ones are. You know, it's, it's going to tell me all that relevant information. And it's going to include citations. Yes. So I can click on all those citations and it'll link me directly to where it's getting that information. So I love perplexity because it's it's like taking information from the web page and like uh, distilling it down into the most important bits of knowledge that I'm asking about. Yeah. Yeah. I love perplexity. Thank you for bringing that up. Because um, it's, yeah. So whatever the tool right? This is so much easier than it used to be, mm -hmm. right? With the internet and with the AI tools, it is, it's not, I mean, it's not easy, right? It takes work, but it is simple. You just need to go through the process. But once you've gone through this process, you now have a list of all of the places, not all, 
but a lot of the places you can go or the to get in place. front of those funeral home directors or owners. Um, and by the way, as you go down this path, this is a living, breathing document. You know, the more you get into the space, other things are going to come up and you can just add to the list. Mm -hmm. But now that I've got my ideal client GPS, now I, now I can make choices about where am I going to go to market my business? You're not going to go everywhere on this list, right? It's not, I mean, it's not uncommon for an ideal client GPS to be a 20 to 30 page document. By the time you, you know, copy and paste all the, that information, it's long. You're not going to be all of those places at once, but you have targeted lists that you can look at and go, you know what? I'm going to join the local funeral home association. I'm going to spend the next six to 12 months getting involved, you know, meeting people there. That's one place I'm going to go. And then, gosh, I've got a list of podcasts geared towards funeral homes. I'm going to start outreaching to them and I'm going to get on some podcasts, right? So again, rather than just, hey, I'm going to be a guest on a podcast, it's no, I'm going to be a guest on podcasts for funeral homes, super targeted. You're getting your message out in front of the exact people that you intend to work with. And the, and the great thing about doing this is you're going to create this document uh, and like you said, it doesn't matter how many pages it is. You're going to have a list of all these different publications, events, trade shows, podcasts, uh, websites, everything, all of the places that your target audience either attends, goes to, hangs out at, et cetera, right? Yeah. And, and now you're going to be able to say, okay, I'm willing to spend ten thousand dollars this year on marketing or let's let's call it twelve thousand dollars a thousand dollars a month okay um and and i'm willing to uh i'm willing to spend a thousand dollars a month or if i want to combine it and do quarters or, or whatever it doesn't matter so uh it, i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna see what i can do for free uh so you know do some podcasts I'm I'm going to join one association because I don't want to join a million things all at once because that you're going to overwhelm yourself with work, yeah. with people, with events, et cetera, right? So join one association and then uh, sponsor one trade show and, and get a booth, right? Yeah. So, you know, d depending on what one you do, that could eat up a big portion of that $12,000 that you've set aside for marketing. But what this is going to do is this is going to give you like all the different ideas. And now you're going to be able to pick and choose what can I do within my means? Yes. And what, what do I think is going to give me the, the best bang for my buck? Obviously, as you start doing this, there's a lot of guessing involved. You know, you, you don't know what type of audience this podcast really has. You don't know how receptive they are to uh, purchasing or, or whatever based on uh, just listening to a podcast episode. You don't know how many people attend this trade show that are actually decision makers and are willing, you know what I mean? So there's, yes. there's a lot of, there's a lot of nuance to this. But what's going to happen is you're going to you're going to do some things. You're going to realize that okay, doing these podcasts maybe doesn't have a direct. Uh, it doesn't directly result in new business, but what it's doing is it's putting me out there as kind of an expert, if you will. And now they're starting to see me often. They're starting to recognize me because I'm out there. I'm putting myself out there and I'm making myself known. And I'm and I'm speaking about IT for funeral homes, for example. Yeah. Uh, and and now now these funeral directors are eventually going to start reaching out to me because they want to work with the guy who knows their industry. They want to work with the guy who they're always hearing on all their favorite podcasts uh, about God knows what <laughs> God yeah. knows what they <laughs> talk about on a funeral home podcast, right? Yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, but you know, the, like that's, th that's the type of thing that's going to happen is you, you don't know what to expect 
And you can't expect immediate results. You have to play the long game with a lot of this stuff. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Um, because, yes, we cannot think short term with our marketing efforts. Many do, and they give up before they've given things the opportunity to work. We've got to think long term. And to play off something else that you said, too, like you're not sure what's going to work and what's not. and even people like me that are in marketing, like nobody can guarantee anything. I mean, because there's so many things beyond our control. With our marketing, we're always testing, we're measuring, and we're learning from that. And then we're just, we're going to iterate and make improvements. It's a constant cycle, mm -hmm. right? And so, but, it, but when you've got this ideal client GPS list, your testing, your measuring, and your learning is much more focused. And it's going to be much more effective over the long term. So um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, so, Steve, we talked about honing in on the target market. We talked about creating your ideal client GPS. Now we've got that M, which is your message, right? Crafting a message to differentiate your MSP from everybody else. And this is something that a lot of MSPs struggle with. And when we struggle to differentiate, we look the same as everybody else. And when we look the same, clients have nothing to compare except price. And we and they default back to price, right? And then as an MSP, you're struggling to increase your price per seat or price per endpoint or however, however else you may be pricing. But if you want to increase your pricing, focusing and narrowing down on who you serve is one of the best ways to do it. So um, I'm going to touch on a few things here. Honestly, I could talk about messaging for the next hour too. But what I want to do is hone in on, on, a, on a few key messaging elements that the, the MSPs that are watching or listening can, can take and start to look at for their business. The important thing is the sequence here is critical. You cannot create a marketing message until you understand who those ideal clients are. Like you mentioned, Steve, the funeral home, right? Are you, are you, who are you talking to? You can understand their lingo. Like you touched on this. Like, I don't know how they refer to, you know, the people that have passed, but if you're in the business day in, day out, you know exactly how they refer to those people, mm -hmm. right? In healthcare, they refer to a lot of people as patients, right? So, you can speak about patients, right? Not customers or clients, but patients. So when we get into their head and we're super focused on who we're going to serve, we can start to use their language and that's what's going to resonate with them. What we want to do with our marketing message is, one, we don't want to talk tech, right? Unless your ideal clients are very technical people. But for most MSPs, their clients are not technical. So if you go into the tech, you've, you're confusing them and confused people do not buy. Yeah, and and I, I've got two things I want to say to that. Sure. One, when, when you go to get your car worked on, you're not going to ask the mechanic, you know, are you using snap-on tools or craftsmen? Yeah. Like, you know, nobody cares. They use some wrenches, okay? Oh, right. Like, like it, it doesn't matter what... And, and there's there's a phrase that somebody said to me, gosh, it's been 15 years now, and it, it has stuck with me ever since then. Uh, they don't care how the watch is made. They just want to know what time it is. Yeah, yeah. So so it's, it's one thing to say, you know what? I specialize in uh, supporting funeral homes that use director's assistant or gather. Like it's okay to talk tech when it's their tech. Yes, but but they don't care if you use Huntress. Nobody cares. Right. They care that I'm going to do my very best to keep the bad guys out. And as as of uh, uh, what is this May of 2024? Oh my gosh, 2024. <laughs> it's, it's May, and I still can't believe it. My shoes don't lace themselves, I and mean, and it's. Upsetting. <laughs> um, 
But as of May of 2024, I have a 100% success rate for all of my clients who follow all my directions and say yes to all of my proposals to where I keep out the bad guys and you don't lose money and time on either downtime or ransomware or whatever. Like, you know, that's that's the type of thing that they care about. Yeah. Yeah. You're not asking the mechanic, oh, you're replacing my alternator? What brand is it? Like, yeah. we don't, we don't, most people don't ask those questions, right? They yeah. might want to know if it's OEM or or not. Yeah. And, and some people want that OEM part. Some people just want to work with Microsoft 365, right? Right. And, and, and that's okay. Like, but, but for the people that, that care about that stuff, let them in my opinion, let them lead the conversation. If right. they start asking technical questions, that doesn't give you permission or consent <laughs> to, yeah. to just start, you know, diarrhea of the mouth about right. all your tech. Yeah. Yeah. So I look in general, we, we don't want to talk about the tech and we don't want to talk about ourselves right? The, our um, clients don't care about us. They care about what we can do for them, right? Uh -huh. Help them get from where they currently are to where they want to be. And so with marketing messaging, we want to focus on the problems that our ideal clients have and don't want and the results and the outcomes they want and don't have. Say that one more time. Focus on the problems they have and don't want and the results and the outcomes that they want and don't have. That's what our message needs to focus on. Um, so what I want to do with the rest of the time that we have is just touch on a few key marketing messaging elements. Um, when we work through this with clients, we put together, a, a we call it a magnetic messaging playbook, but I want to touch on some of the really important elements of that. Um, the first thing is a one-liner, which a lot of people will think of like an elevator pitch, right? It, that your one liner answers that question of you know what do you what do you do and it's the job of our one liner is not to answer all of the potential questions that somebody might have about us it's really just to grab their attention and gain their interest that's it right you're never nobody can say in two sentences everything that they do right but when somebody so for example, for me, when somebody says, well, what do you do? You know, I say, look, I, I provide marketing consulting, advisory, and outsourced or part-time marketing executive work. So I help MSPs build or update and then manage their marketing engine to get where they want to go faster. Does that answer everything, every question somebody might have? No, it doesn't. Gives people a high level idea of what I do and where I focus. And if that's something that they're interested in, then they're going to say like, well, tell me more about that. Like, how do you help people build a marketing engine? How do you help them manage it? Right. If they're interested, they're going to ask more questions, but it's simple, right? It's concise. That's what we want. So that's what our one liner is. Second element is we're going to, we talk about our core message. Okay, and your core message is that marketing message that you're going to use to clearly communicate the benefit of doing business with your company. It's a it's a sentence. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one of what we want to think about here, some of the questions we want to ask ourselves to start brainstorming. What is that core message? Right. What makes you different from the competition? Right. Is there a promise? that you can make that will solve the problems your ideal clients have, right? What is the, what is the problem that you're really solving for clients, right? Why should they choose you versus any, any other MSP, right? In the example of the siding contractor, that core message of, hey, we'll treat your home like it's our own. That's an example of a core message. For, for my company, it's it's remove your revenue roadblocks, right? If you want to grow, you've got to remove the your revenue roadblocks, right? It's simple. It's quick. That's what we want to do here, right? And, and it can be based on, 
you know, the theme of your business and what you believe in. It could be based on price. It could be based on product or service. It could be some type of positioning, but we want to have a core message that we can put out there. The next thing we want to consider is how are we going to create a competitive advantage with our, with our message? And again, this is a spot where a lot of MSPs struggle. Um, but if we're going to differentiate and command the highest prices possible, we have to create a competitive advantage. So there's, there's three checks or, you know, or thresholds that I think a competitive advantage needs to meet. One is, is it true? Like when you say, I mean, is it true or is it false? <laughs> if it's false, then <laughs> don't put it out there, right? Um, is it relevant, right? Is it relevant to your ideal clients? If, if it's true, but it's not relevant to them, they're not gonna care about it. And if they don't care about it, then it's not gonna be a differentiator, right? And it's not gonna create a competitive advantage. And then the last thing is, is it like, is it provable? Can you prove it? Is it true? Is it relevant? Is it provable? I believe you can have three to five differentiators to help you create a competitive advantage. I don't think you want a whole lot more than that. Um, but here are some things to, to, to think about uh, as you start to hone in on like, what is my competitive advantage? And by the way, Steve, going back, for the, one of the first things we talked about, you, when you do ideal client interviews, they will tell you things that are competitive advantage elements that you can use, right? So you're, you're, you're relying on your ideal clients and what they've told you to start extracting, like, you know, first off, think about like, how can you help clients save or make money? How, how can you help them save time? How can you help them reduce risk and eliminate hassles? Those are good things to start to look at to see if some, some good competitive advantage elements come to the surface there, right? It's going to help you start to brainstorm. But here are some additional questions you can think about. Like what's non-negotiable in the industry? This goes back to my point of, you know, High quality products, you know, great customer service, like that's table stakes. That, that like people expect that. That is a non-negotiable. Things that are non-negotiable are not differentiators. They will not help you create a competitive advantage, which is why you want to ask yourself that question. But like, what, what is it that really differentiates my business? That's one of the questions that you can ask in an ideal client interview. Right now, what's when when I think of non-negotiables, I feel like there's there's two different types of non-negotiables. There's the client's non-negotiables, and there's our non-negotiables. Mm -hmm. So, for example, with funeral homes, even though the person is dead, it is still considered patient data. Yeah. So that means funeral homes have to follow HIPAA guidelines yes so like not all of them do right you know right, not right. all doctors offices do yeah. so it you know is it okay for an msp to say uh following hipaa is, you know as as far as what we're doing for the it and how you're using your it is a non-negotiable absolutely right absolutely um the difference though is that's more of a that's a, more of how you're positioning certain things and frankly what you're requiring of your clients right so for example in the hip example like if you're talking to somebody that doesn't isn't really concerned about hipaa compliance but you are they're not an ideal client right mm -hmm. that's one of those things in your that you can hone in on with your ideal client where it's like, Hey, look, we only work with funeral homes that are concerned and hold in high regard HIPAA compliance, right? That's one of the attributes of our ideal clients. And if they don't care, then they're not going to be a good client because, you know, look, as an MSP, right, that can come back on you. 
right? So that's one of those things that you're making a choice of, hey, that's a non-negotiable for us because we know it's what's best for the client, but it's also something that's going to protect us. With the competitive advantage, when, when I talk about a non-negotiable, it's more along the lines of a non-negotiable from the client standpoint rather than your standpoint. Because a non-negotiable on the client side, you're not going to be able to bring that up and have them see it as something that's going to be different. Right? Because uh-huh. it's it's non-negotiable. Everybody that they talk to, they're going to expect to do that. Yeah. And if you don't, they're not even going to consider you at all. So non-negotiables are not going to be differentiators. They're not going to create a competitive advantage. But, okay, so what if, is there a way that we can spin the non-negotiables as as an advantage and, and hear me out like what if on our home page we put like you know we we understand you have expectations mm-hmm. we answer when you call uh that that you have 99.9 percent uptime that uh you you never have a, a catastrophic loss of data yeah you know like that type of thing where we're we're just putting the non-negotiables out there to to just kind of almost get it out of the way like we understand you have expectations we're going to meet those expectations let's move on to something else more important and talk about our differentiators yeah yeah you depending on the non-negotiable you may be able to position it as a differentiator in most cases though it's going to be tough to do that but like let's say you know, a lot of your competitors don't require what you're doing and it's actually in the client's best interest, you could position that, right? But th- you just mentioned a perfect potential competitive advantage element, which is like response time, right? As an MSP, can you guarantee a specific re- response time? You know, we're going to respond in 10 minutes or, you know, mm-hmm. you know, of tickets are solved within one hour, right? If you can put that kind of stuff out there and your competitors are not, that starts to create a differentiator. That goes back to, that's an example of eliminating hassle, right? When I've got an IT issue, I don't want to be sitting around, you know, twiddling my thumbs for two hours. As an MSP, if you're willing to make a promise that other people are not, that creates a strong differentiator and a strong competitive advantage. Um, you know, which goes back to one of the questions I was going to say is like, what can you say about certain aspects of your expertise that other, others can't or won't or are afraid to? There's a lot of MSPs that are afraid to say like, hey, we can, we'll respond in X amount of time or we're going to solve a ticket in X amount of time. A lot of people won't say that. They won't commit to that. And if that's the case and you're willing to do that, that creates a strong competitive advantage. So um, we talked about one-liner. We talked about core message. We talked about starting to create your competitive advantage and and differentiate your MSP. Um, The last thing I want to talk about from a messaging standpoint is your point of view, right? We all have a point of view but a lot of us don't share it. And, um, and, and is this one of those, like, I think hot dogs are sandwiches kind of point of views or. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Could be. Yeah, absolutely. So you think of it like your point of view, it's used in your messaging and your content to make you look different, right. To make you magnetic, not boring. Right. A lot of the IT stuff that's put out there is just, general IT data. And, and again, when you're talking to people that aren't technical people, are they, do they really care? Like, do your ideal, ideal clients care about that? No, they don't. So if you can craft a point of view, and by the way, you, you don't just have one point of view. We all have points of view on different things. So you can have multiple points of view. But to start crafting your point of view, you can ask yourself some questions. So what is something that you believe that others don't, right? In the IT industry, 
you know, what are what is a commonly held belief in IT that you disagree with? You know, what is something that you believe that is meant to protect your audience, your ideal clients from harm? Those are three good questions you can ask to start to think about like what what things do I believe? You know, what is my point of view related to certain IT things? And is it different than what a lot of other people believe? You know, so for example, for me, one of my points of view is that there's no marketing easy button. There are a lot of marketers out there that are saying, hey, do this and we're going to guarantee X, Y, and Z. And they know full well that they have no control over the, that end result. There are things they can do to help people get to that result, but they cannot guarantee it, right? And because of that, there are a lot of MSPs just looking for that marketing easy button. You know, they're looking for that one thing that's gonna change the direction of their marketing. And that does not exist. It is a number of things in combination that come together that will make your marketing successful, make it consistent and repeatable over time. So there is no marketing easy button. That is an example of a point of view that I have with marketing that's a little bit different than some people, right? I also believe that there's no one size fits all marketing plan. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of people out there that are like, hey, just follow this plan it, it, and it'll work. That does not work. Because if, if I even if I'm talking to two MSPs that are at the exact same revenue, right? The plan to get where they want to go is going to be different because guess what? Where they want to go is different. The people they have are different. The resources they have are different, right? Some of the goals they have may be different. There's a lot of variables there that make it so that you can't just like take somebody else's plan and just run with it. There's no one size fits all plan. So those are a few examples of points of view. But when I have those points of view, I can then start to inject those points of view in my marketing message, in my social posts, in emails that I'm sending out, in content that I'm creating. And that over time helps position me or you as the MSP as different than your competitors. So those are key marketing elements that, um, key messaging elements that you need to have at a minimum in your messaging playbook. So we, um, man, I, I think we got a few minutes to spare, Steve, but uh, that's, that's it, right? We talked about him, honing in on the target market, creating your ideal client GPS, and then creating a marketing message to attract and engage those people that you intend to work with. Uh, this has been so awesome. And I think, you know, the, the cool thing is like, I feel like I already knew what you were saying, you know what I mean? But, yeah. but having it put in this specific order, like I've thought of all of these different things individually, but you've just given me a plan of like, here's, here's how to take all of these little nuggets of, of knowledge and how to put it together into a plan. And, and, Honestly, uh, I want to hear MSPs, uh, those of you that made it to the end, tell us in the comments, uh, who, who are you honing in on? Um, gosh, what, what, what were the, I know message is last. What was the second Honing one? in on, who are your ideal clients you're going to hone in on? Um, where might you be able to go to get in front of them, right? Creating your ideal client GPS. I, ideal, that's what it yep. is. Um, so yeah, who, who are you going to hone in on? Where are you going to go? And what is your message? I want to know that put it in the comments and, uh, who knows, maybe, maybe let's follow up in a, in a few months and see what have you accomplished? How has this helped you? I, I can't wait to see what this does for you guys. Um, Tim, thank you so much for being my guest today. I, I, I really appreciate it, man. And I appreciate uh, it, you having me. And if people are interested, uh, again, you've got that resource. Uh, they can email you at info at rialtomarketing.com. And that is up on the screen here. 
And uh, you're going to give them, what, what are you giving them again? I'm giving them what the document we call an ideal client profiler. It's that list of questions that you can ask when you interview your ideal clients. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tim. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. I hope you all have an awesome rest of your day.